Now, dear listener, you know I've talked to you a lot on the Politocrat Daily Podcast about making your own podcast. And let me tell you something. Anchor gives you the best opportunity to do that. It's free of charge. Yes, it's free. And there are lots of creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your own phone or computer. How about that? And you can even add songs to your podcast from Spotify. It's really wonderful. You can do this. And it really is very easy. And Anchor will even distribute your podcast for you. It can be heard on all kinds of platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make some money too. And money making is a good thing. It's everything you need in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The following edition of the Politocrat Daily Podcast contains descriptions of violence and other accounts that may be traumatic for some. Welcome to the Politocrat. I am Omar Moore. It is Monday, May the 31st, 2021. On this edition of the Politocrat... I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men seeing being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Our country may forget this history, but I cannot. I will not. And other survivors do not. And our descendants do not. Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Exactly 100 years ago today. The stories, the history, the present, and what we must do now. All of that coming up next. Exactly 100 years ago today, on May 31st, 1921, White violence. A white mob killed between 300 and 600 black people. That mob murdered human beings, men, women, children. That mob burned down thousands of homes, hundreds of businesses, churches, schools, the town was Greenwood a town owned, operated, controlled, and run by black people. Thriving communities, infrastructures, systems, wealth, and white mobs destroyed all of that. in 18 hours.
What you're going to be hearing on this episode is a variety of sources of audio. You're also going to be hearing from the survivors, one of the survivors, one of the three survivors of the white massacre of black people in Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You're going to be hearing from her first and foremost. And then you're going to be hearing from a number of different people. You're going to be hearing from activists and advocates and descendants of those murdered exactly 100 years ago today. This violence, state-sponsored, sanctioned, approved violence, encouraged by and abetted and aided and acted and participated in by police and firefighters and politicians and others, who are white, in Greenwood, deputizing white lynch mobs. This violence took place on May 31st, 1921, and June 1st, 1921, in Greenwood. You will be hearing audio from some audio from Stanley Nelson's documentary, The Tulsa Race Massacre, Tulsa Burning. First, here is the testimony. Earlier this month, May of 2021, of one of the three remaining survivors that are known from the white, violent mob massacre of black people. Her name is Mother Fletcher. Viola Fletcher is 107 years old. She was just seven years old when she witnessed and experienced white terrorism and violence visited upon her and her family and the community of Greenwood. And here now, is her testimony this month before the House Judiciary Committee on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. My name is Viola Ford Fletcher. <clears throat> I'm the daughter of Lucinda Ellis and John Wesley Ford of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm the sister of Hughes Van Ellis, who is also here today. I'm a survivor of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Two weeks ago, I celebrated my 107th birthday. (laughs) Today, I'm visiting Washington, D.C. for the first time in my life. I'm here seeking justice and I'm asking my country to acknowledge what happened in Tulsa in 1921. On May 31st in 21, I went to bed in my family's home in Greenwood. Neighbors of Tulsa, the neighborhood I felt asleep in that night was rich, not just in terms of wealth, but in culture, humanity, Heritage and my family had a beautiful home. We had great neighbors and I had friends to play with. I felt safe. I had everything a child could need. I had a bright future ahead of me. Greenwood could 
Still, Greenwood should have given me the chance to make, truly make it in this country. Within a few hours, all of that was gone. The night of the massacre, I was awakened by my family. My parents and five siblings were there. I was told we had to leave, and that was it. I will never forget the violence of the white mob when we left our home. I still see black men seeing being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. Our country may forget this history, but I cannot. I will not. And other survivors do not. And our descendants do not. When my family was forced to leave Tulsa, I lost my chance of an education. I never finished school past the fourth grade. I have never made much money in my country. uh, State and city took a lot from me. Despite this, I spent time supporting the war effort in the shipyards of California. But most of my life, I was a domestic worker serving white families. I never made much money, but to this day, I can barely afford my everyday needs. All the while, the city of this Tulsa have unjustly used the names and stories of victims like me to enrich myself and its white allies through the 30s million, through the 30s million raised by the Tulsa Centennial Commissioner while I was continued to live in poverty. I am 107 year old and have never been seen justice. I pray that one day I will. I have been blessed with a long life and have seen the best and the worst of this country. I think about the terror, horror inflicted upon black people in this country every day. This subcontinued committee has the power to lead us down a better path. I'm asking that my country acknowledge what has been happened to me, the tremors and the pain, the loss, and I ask the survivors and descendants to be given the chance to seek, seek justice, open the door. All of you know how easy it is to deny that, that a violent mob threatened your lives and took your property for 70 years, the city of Tulsa and its stream of tremors told us that the massacre didn't happen, like we didn't see it with our own eyes. You have, <coughs> have me here right now. You see Mother Randall, you see my brother, Hughes Van Ellis. We live this history and we can't ignore it. it it's our lives with us. Oh my goodness. We lost everything that day, our homes, our churches, our newspapers, our theaters, our lives. Greenwood represented all the best of what was possible for black people in America and for all for all the people. No one cared about us for almost 100 years. We and our history have been forgotten, washed away. This Congress must recognize us and our history for black America, for the white Americans, and for all Americans with that some justice. That was Mother Viola Fletcher, 107 years of age, testifying in May of 2021 on what she experienced and witnessed exactly 100 years ago today. Welcome back. It 
is important to provide some foundational overlay. So that it, you understand that what happened in Greenwood, the white violence that happened in Greenwood to black people in Greenwood did not happen in a vacuum. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of other white, violent, genocidal massacres of black people happening across the United States of America. Both before and after what happened 100 years ago today in Greenwood, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And those massacres of black people by white people were not confined to the South. Here are excerpts from Stanley Nelson's documentary entitled Tulsa Burning, the 1921 race massacre. Me at the core, and it should, any conscious human being, the fact that we just dump bodies of human beings, of patriots, of veterans, of teachers, of husbands, wives, children in mass graves. Nobody ever had a chance to say goodbye. If you're a black person, you're living in 1890, what does the world look like? So it's post-Civil War. It's post the collapse of Reconstruction in 1877. It's a place rife with structural, systemic oppression and racism of the Deep South, places like Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, etc. You have a sense among some African Americans that black men, women, and children really wanting to assert their rights as citizens. But you also have this tension. And what happened essentially was white people who had once owned black people had to endure what was in their minds a humiliation of passing a polling place and seeing a person they once owned casting a vote. After the collapse of Reconstruction, meaning when the government withdrew troops from the South to no longer guarantee black freedom, they... The Southerners began to reimpose slavery by another name. These were laws that were designed to create really a status for former slaves that was not enslavement, but involved all sorts of repression and subordination. Black codes were created to criminalize African Americans in the most arbitrary manner possible. And it essentially encouraged racialized violence against African Americans, you know, running them off their land, burning their homes, killing members of the family, raping women, lynchings. You also have the formation of the Ku Klux Klan. Organizations that are really meant to control black people, limit their mobility, terrorize them, and if black men deign to vote, mobs visit their houses, they beat the black men, they often kill them, rape women in the household, daughters, mothers. So you have this ritualized terror. An African American owning his own piece of land his own farm, his own horse and buggy. These kinds of things were rallying cries for racial violence on the part of white Southerners.
So you have black people really looking west as a place of opportunity, as a place where they can get away from the oppression of Southern whites. You know, you are going to a promised land. That's a huge political statement. That freedom of mobility, freedom of self-determination. And so you start to see people moving in the South, saying, enough of this. I'm going to find someplace else to go. That last voice that you heard there was that of Reverend Robert Turner. He is the pastor of the church that survived this violent assault and massacre 100 years ago in Greenwood. The church is still standing. There were many churches in Greenwood, a 40-block town, 40 blocks. There were many churches that did not survive. And as I said, in 18 hours or less, 40 blocks, 40 blocks of a black town, owned, operated, controlled and run by black people had been destroyed. When I return, a few more excerpts from the documentary by Stanley Nelson entitled Tulsa Burning. Here is Edwin McCabe. He is really thinking that maybe this is an opportunity for a black state. He advocates for the establishment of a black state. He goes to work on this front in Washington. Um, When that does not come to pass, he moves on to pushing for black towns. He acquires 320 acres of land, and he names it Langston City. There's Lincoln, Liberty. There's Bowley, which is fairly well known. Taft, Rentiesville, Tatums, Grayson, Summit, Vernon, Redbird, Clearview, and Wybark. Those are some of the communities. The black towns were incredibly prideful places. My grandmother grew up having black teachers, black principals, knowing black judges, having black doctors, black nurses. I mean, this was considered an all-black world, right? It was an opportunity for people to live largely unmolested to show their economic prowess, to govern themselves, sort of laboratories of democracy and capitalism. Their very existence gives black people a sense that they can truly be free and equal, a sense that there were places, communities, where black people didn't have to worry about terrorism in the same way, but they didn't have to worry about the everyday slights and indignity of segregation. Oklahoma was a territory before it became a state. Blacks and Native Americans lived together. They lived, died, and were buried together. African Americans and Native Americans did not want for Oklahoma to become a state because they knew that Southerners were bringing their racism directly from the South out West. Jim Crow segregation, white Southern racism, white supremacy, the KKK, that is what came with the state of Oklahoma. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Nails Alford. 
As I ponder today's events, I thought of my grandparents and our community members. And I know that they could never have imagined this day and time when we would be speaking about the race massacre, let alone looking for the remains of those who were lost so tragically during those horrible days. statehood is the immediate imposition of the mores regulations of the Jim Crow South in housing, in transportation, and even the segregation of telephone booths. With this imposition of this sort of Southern way of life, it's a real disillusionment. Oklahoma is your last chance to get land. So this is the place you want to go. This is the place you want to be. And then to have upon statehood the Southern way of life imposed upon you, that's heartbreaking. The other thing that's going on in the same period is lynching. Lynching is nothing short of domestic terrorism to keep black people in their place, to reinforce white supremacy. The first recorded lynching happens in Oklahoma on Christmas Eve of 1907, right after statehood. And from there on, there's a spate of lynchings. Those lynchings happened in over a dozen communities. And those communities included Oklahoma City, Norman, Oklahoma, Purcell, Shawnee, Wagoner, Medill. They preserve segregation. They preserve second-class citizenship by essentially picking out black people and shooting them, hanging them, or burning them alive in public. This is part of what happens when blacks begin to assert self-determination. One thing I think that is underappreciated about black communities in Oklahoma is that you did have black people fight back. And you have figures such as Ida B. Wells saying that a Winchester rifle should have an honored place in every black home. Ida B. Wells is probably the foremost anti-lynching activist who emerged in the late 19th century. She realized that African Americans being run off their lands and being lynched was not for the purposes of avenging a rape, those false accusations. It was due to economic jealousy. What she writes, this is what opened my eyes to what lynching really was, an excuse to get rid of Negroes who were acquiring wealth and property and thus keep the race terrorized and, quote, keep the nigger down. If we look back to this moment, it had to be a moment of great confusion for African Americans. Where do they fit in? Where do they work? Where do they live safely and freely? One of the key things that's undergirding this for African Americans is the right to make their own decisions. The right to move where they want it to move. Welcome back. In this excerpt from Stanley Nelson's must-see documentary, Tulsa Burning, which shows on the History Channel. Be sure to watch the entire documentary. In this portion, you're going to be hearing about Greenwood, how the black town, Greenwood, thrived. This is living, breathing history. Listen to this. You have all sorts of businesses in Greenwood. You have everything from funeral parlors to theaters, hotel. There's a public library, a black library. 
There are chili houses, cafes, restaurants. There's just everything there. There were a dozen surgeons and doctors. There were several lawyers. There was a black-owned photography studio. There are black working people. They're not working necessarily in oil, but they're working in all sorts of businesses that are supporting the oil boom. My grandfather uh, was a very proud, college-educated shoemaker from Prairie View A&M. And he, along with my great-uncle, were the owners of the Nails Brothers Shoe Shop and Record Shop that was located on North Greenwood Avenue in Tulsa. There were John and Lula Williams that had come to Tulsa on a wagon. John Williams was a mechanic. He was very good with machines. And he had secured a job for himself working for an ice cream company. So his services were in such demand that he was able to make a pretty good living. And the family bought the first car in Greenwood. But it was Lula Williams who was the real entrepreneur. They had purchased a building right on the corner of Archer and Greenwood. And on the first floor was a confectionery, a sweet shop. She also, across the street, had opened up Dreamland Theater. She actually owned three movie theaters. So if you wanted to see and be seen, that's where you would be. Greenwood was a community of necessity. It was a segregated enclave. Uh, Black folks couldn't apply their trades or purchase goods and services in the larger white community so they created their own economy. That economy became successful because black folks did business with one another and kept dollars largely in the black community. What happens in Greenwood is that segregation, which is not necessarily desired, segregation actually enables black businesses to thrive, black professionals to thrive. It was a district where, in fact, money dollars could turn over five or six times in greenwood you could um, as a black person uh, you could advance um, and you had a number of individuals in the community that were prospering my uncle he was a physician his name was andrew jackson lived up on detroit street in the 500 block sort of a hill right up that street Detroit in those days had the nicest houses. The Negroes did. The principal of the school lived up there. We had dentists up there. We had wonderful doctors. And my uncle, I told you his name was Dr. Jackson. My great-grandfather's name was J.B. Stradford. He grew up in Kentucky. His parents were slaves. He was able to get a law degree, um, go to Oberlin College, and really start his entrepreneurial career in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Stratford Hotel was one of the largest black-owned hotels in the United States. It was a beautiful building, and leaders from throughout the country, when they came through the Midwest, would often stay uh, at the Stratford Hotel. You have black entertainers that are playing there. Jazz being a really important scene. We think about jazz in, in, in Kansas, in Kansas City. It's also important in Greenwood. Because of the success of Greenwood, Booker T. Washington coined the phrase uh, Greenwood as the Black Wall Street or the Negro Wall Street of America. As the community grows and grows in affluence, and grows in confidence. These race men and women come to the fore. They articulate a kind of outrage about racism. They articulate a kind of self-determination. They articulate a resistance. Andrew Jackson Smitherman worked as an attorney and as a journalist. He was a Creek freedman and teamed up with J.B. Stratford to create the Tulsa Star, the first daily black newspaper in Oklahoma. The black newspaper at that time was uh, a forum for pointing out black achievement at a time when white newspapers presented black people only in crime. But the heart of it was an agitation for justice and an agitation against lynching. At the same time that's happening, you see in the summer of 1919 a rise of racial terror all over the country. Philadelphia. 
Philadelphia, Memphis, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Elaine, Arkansas. We could go on and on and on. A lot of these riots are really fueled by anxieties about black advancement and black success. And we're not only talking about cities like Chicago or D.C. or New York. We're talking about cities like Tulsa. In 1921, those same tensions in the United States were present in Tulsa. And it did revolve around jealousy and resentment. It threatened the system of white supremacy. Certainly in Tulsa, which was an incredible concentration of black wealth, you can look at Tulsa as a tinderbox. Like, what is the spark that's going to ignite it? More coming up right after this. Think about how Greenwood could have been such a enduring city right now, right now in 2021 and beyond. Just think about Greenwood and what it could have been. Think about all of these black towns across the United States that were destroyed by white violence and white mobs. Think about how much richer black people would have been, how much richer the country would have been. This wealth, the people who generated it, the people who thrived, were all destroyed, destroyed, killed, massacred, genocided, right here in the United States. 100 years ago is not a very long time ago at all, especially when we're talking about history. And as James Baldwin says, history is the present. On Memorial Day, May 30th, 1921, a young African-American male is walking in downtown Tulsa on Main Street. His name is Dick Rowland. He dropped out of Booker T. Washington High School, where he's a football player, to take a job shining shoes downtown. But he worked in a white patronized shoeshine parlor where there were no toilet facilities for African Americans. So the white owner of the parlor arranged it so his African American employees would walk down Main Street, go to the Drexel building, ride the elevator to the fourth floor where there was a colored bathroom. And the elevator operator in the Drexel building was a young white teenager named Sarah Page. Sarah Page is manually operating the elevator. Something happens that caused the elevator to jerk or to lurch and Dick Rowland bumped into Sarah Page. She began to scream. Dick Rowland, frightened, ran from the elevator. We don't know exactly what happened, but we know something happened. Dick Rowland bumped into her. Dick Rowland stepped on her shoe. She was not expecting him, and she screamed. And then Dick Rowland is seen running out of the Drexel building. Sarah Page exited the elevator. He was comforted by a clerk from a locally owned store called Renberg's. She told him about being assaulted on the elevator. The clerk, who was comforting her, called the police. The next day, Tulsa police show up at Dick's home. He's arrested. He's taken downtown to the courthouse awaiting arraignment. That could have been the end of the story had it not been for the intervention of the Tulsa Tribune, the Daily Afternoon newspaper. The Tribune published a story the next day entitled Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. It was a false narrative about an attempted rape in broad daylight in downtown Tulsa. The story was very incendiary. It used all kinds of buzzwords and menacing images that invoked this notion of of a black man assaulting the white woman, which was a euphemism for rape. The newspaper story uh, is published around 3 o'clock. By 4 o'clock, a small group of white men have begun to assemble around and, and mill around the courthouse. This goes on for several hours. 
more and more whites showing up, murmuring about lynching Dick Rowland. First the crowd is 50, then 100, then 200, then 300, 400, 500 whites gathered outside of the Tulsa County Courthouse in whose jail Dick Rowland is held in a top floor jail cell. The crowd wants the sheriff to turn over the prisoner because they're going to kill him. They're going to lynch him. When black people began to hear around 9 o'clock, 9.15, that there is a, a, you know, a possible lynching of Dick Rowland, that's when J.P. Stratford, that's when O.W. Gurley, that's when A.J. Smitherman have a meeting at the offices of the Tulsa Star. As the newspaper editor, A.J. Smitherman knew that this was a dog whistle, that this was the call for lynching, that it was trouble. A.J. Smitherman was a civil rights advocate. Uh, he had a voice because he had a newspaper. Not only would he write stories, he would actually put his body at risk. I mean, he would actually engage in incidents where there was threats of racial uh, violence. And so there is a debate, and rightly so, what is the best plan of action? Is it to go downtown arm and offer assistance? Is it to just send, you know, a, a small group or send one? The day a member of our group is mobbed in Tulsa, the streets will be bathed in blood. If I can't get anyone to go with me, I will go single-handed and then resign myself to that fate. Ultimately, the idea of going downtown armed is what prevails. At about 9 o'clock, a group of African-American World War I vets, all of whom were armed with pistols, rifles, shotguns, many of them have put on their army uniforms, march up to the front steps of the courthouse, and they approach Sheriff McAuliffe, and they say, uh, Sheriff, we are here to help defend the prisoner. They were told, don't worry, he will not be lynched, no one's going to take him, he's going to be safe here. And the men leave. But the effect that the vets had on the white lynch mob is just transformative. Upon seeing this group of black men who have uh, come downtown, you know, boldly uh, holding their weapons, um, you know, in this very manly, courageous way, it electrifies the, the whites. They go nuts. Um, members of the mob run home to get their own guns. And not only came back with weapons, brought others with them. The mob is getting bigger, 600, 700, 800 people armed, angry. 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, a larger group of black men return to downtown. But they know that a black person is about to be murdered by a lynching in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they are not going to let that happen. By this time, the crowd has grown to, to nearly 2,000, if not more. One of the white men approaches one of the black men who's holding a gun and said, what are you doing with that gun? And the black man says, what's it to you? The white man who's bumped into tries to take away the gun. A struggle ensues, a shot goes off, and then another shot and another shot. And then, in the words of the sheriff, all hell broke loose. And the worst single incident of racial violence in American history begins. Next, what you're going to be hearing from Stanley Nelson's documentary in this excerpt is how this massacre began. That's what you're going to be hearing here. And these violent white men and what they did and how black people stood up and defended themselves against this state violence and this terrorized and terrorizing event. This evil that occurred 100 years ago on this very day. And tell them, you know, get a gun and go get a nigger. 
Black people are being shot and killed. Uh, black people are fleeing. They're fighting as they go. But ultimately, the, the blacks do get back along the perimeter of Greenwood. And they knew uh, the advantage of having a fortified place from which to resist. Some of them lined themselves up along the Frisco Railroad tracks because this is the entrance to Greenwood. They want to protect the neighborhood. J.B. Straffer goes to the second floor of his hotel because it's a good view and he can fight hard from there. And there are some men, African-American war veterans, they seek out the highest point in Tulsa, which is the Mount Zion Baptist Church. They climb up into that tower. During the nighttime hour, there was an effort by some white mob members to cross the tracks from the white part of downtown into deep Greenwood. But every time they tried to cross the tracks, they were met with volley after volley where black property owners and other residents are defending their property. There was a certain type of silence that occurred late in the night. And you might have thought that it was over, that the black men won the war that night, and that they had successfully defended Greenwood. By two and three in the morning, things seemed to get quiet. But it's a false quiet, because what's happening is that all across Tulsa, angry whites, members of that mob, are now organizing. They rally thousands of whites. They get their guns, they get their torches, they get their kerosene, and they line up around the perimeter of Black Tulsa, and they wait. And they wait until the sun rises. We don't know how many whites have organized, but certainly in the thousands. And they've gathered along the railroad tracks that divide Greenwood from much of the white community. Right after dawn, there is this weird siren that is heard downtown. And when that siren went off, there was just a full onslaught of gunfire, of um, airplanes flying uh, and dropping incendiary devices, which we now know are turpentine balls, onto the tops of buildings. And it was just an all-out massacre of Greenwood. We could hear the mob coming. You could hear them coming up the street, house by house, saying, come out of there, come out of there. We didn't go out the front way. We went out our back door and we went up under the porch. After watching the men unload on First Street, we heard such a buzzing noise. There was a great shadow in the sky. And upon second look, we discerned that this cloud was caused by fast approaching aeroplanes. We could hear bombing. What they were using for bombs, whether it was just dynamite or what. But we could hear the bombs. Smoke ascended the sky in thick, black volumes. And amid it all, the planes, now a dozen or more in the number, hummed and darted here and there. Planes began to fly over. Machine gun fire began. And then white men rush into the community, firing into homes, firing into front parlors and kitchens and children's bedrooms. I mean, this was an intentional military-styled attack. There are a number of gunfights that we know about that, that break out across Greenwood as, as groups of black men and women uh, armed, you know, with rifles and shotguns and pistols are attempting to save their community. Stratford decided that he needed to defend his hotel. And so from the second floor, he was able to uh, aim down at the street. He had a shotgun and he had a pistol. And he would have his son load one weapon while he fired the other there's a furious firefight that happens at mount zion baptist church this incredibly new beautiful church that had been just dedicated a few months earlier there were men in the bell tower trying to defend not only the church but all the homes in the community as well the white rioters start firing at that they have machine guns on a nearby hill they open up on the church destroy the rose glass window other folks hear the gunshots they get worried they start to stream out of town where the hell are you going you're leaving the 
inward. Uh-huh. And my grandpa said, we're here to we're going out of town. And said, not this day, you're not going out of town. Bam. Millen Valley Track was just lined with people going north. And some were in the head rags, old gowns, because they didn't have any time to get dressed to get out. Even some women left their shoes and was just walking down the track with no shoes on. People are coming out of their homes. They're surrendering to these special deputies, the National Guard. But it's at the point that black people have been removed from their homes, detained, that the burning, the systematic burning of homes, of businesses began. What I remember mostly is when all of a sudden my mother was excited is because that she saw four men coming toward our house. And all of them had torches, lighted torches on their side, coming straight to our house. What happens is that Greenwood citizens are not there to defend their property. Whites then start smashing in to the stores and homes on Greenwood Avenue, breaking glasses, breaking windows, uh, busting down doors, and helping themselves to whatever they'd like. At no point did police or the fire department tried to prevent that burning, right? It was, the, the, the community was, a, was simply allowed to be destroyed. That next morning, when the National Guard had come in to evacuate Greenwood, they coerced Stratford to come out. And they said, as long as you surrender, we promise that nothing will happen to your hotel. But of course, that was a lie. He surrendered, he turned himself in, and they immediately torched his hotel. They're being led away at gunpoint to these so-called internment centers around town, the fairgrounds, the municipal auditorium, uh, the baseball park. To get out of these centers, people generally had to have a green identification card countersigned by a white person that was willing to vouch for them. So here you are, you've been illegally arrested by white civilians. You have no idea what's happened to your loved ones if you've been separated from them. If that was your uncle, your brother, your son, your father, you're going to never know what happened to them. to the community was intentional, it was conscious, it was systematic. When the dust settled, somewhere between 100 and 300 people were killed. At least 1,250 homes in the black community were destroyed. 35 square blocks, 36 square blocks, 40 square blocks, just obliterated it. You could see the iron, you know, metal bed stands where there used to be homes. Two million dollars in black wealth went up in flames, right? That was never recouped. And for people who didn't know what happened to their loved ones, identified as well as unidentified African-American massacre victims were being buried in unmarked graves across the city. Never again. Never. Forget.
Imagine everything you owned leveled, not by a natural disaster, but by a mob of people who destroyed everything, murdered people, your family, loved ones, and you never so much as received an apology, much less anything else like reparations. That word reparations terrifies some black people and terrifies a great many white people. Why? Why does it do that? When September 11th, 2001 happened, there was a victim's compensation fund for the survivors of 9-11, people directly affected by that terrorist attack. The comedian and activist John Stewart, also a filmmaker, John Stewart, testified before Congress about keeping the Victims' Compensation Fund going for the survivors of 9-11-2001. And it was his testimony that was instrumental in maintaining the renewal and having that renewal of that victim's compensation fund. That's a form of reparations. The ability to make a person whole, to restore something, to repair. It won't obviously bring back what was lost but it will be something that gives the people harmed and their descendants a something to hold on to, to say, to recognize, A, yes, this happened to you and yours. And here is what we're going to do to repair you. In this way, to repair some of this damage, this violence, to repair what happened to you. Here, we're going to give you resources. Here, we're going to give you money. Here, we're going to give you this. Here, we're going to give you that. We're going to give you scholarships. We're going to give you this. We're going to give you that. We're going to give you here. This piece of the community is yours. This town, this place, this area is yours. That's what reparations are about. Just some of what it's about. And the people of Greenwood have not so much as received an official apology. And the Republicans in Greenwood and in Tulsa and in the state statewide have done nothing but throw symbolic bouquets and put money in funds that don't go to any of the people in the community of Greenwood. None of those black people are receiving anything, including the survivors themselves, like the person you heard from to start this podcast episode, Mother Viola Fletcher, 107 years old. She was seven at the time of this terrorist attack in Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she has not received in all of this time so much as a single penny. No one has. The Stratford family, J.B. Stratford's great-granddaughter. They've received nothing. No one has received anything. You're going to be hearing from her and some, and from some other individuals coming up right after this.
your great grandfather? My great grandfather owned the largest hotel uh, in America, owned by an African American. Yes. Considering the wealth that was lost when state-sponsored violence destroyed that hotel, what do you think is owed to you and your family? Well, I think the possibility of recreating something that um, he had interest in, which is to care for other people, make housing available for those who needed it. Dr. Crutcher, I want, I want to turn to you on this because your story is quite unique here. You're also a descendant um, of Black Wall Street, and you're also been impacted by police violence, more state-sponsored violence against the black community when your brother was shot by a member of law enforcement. Having um, that double weight of the past and the present convene right here at this moment, what does it feel like to sit right here where violence 100 years ago struck? Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I don't even know where to start. It, it, this, our, our family story is so complex uh, and so layered um, and, and so traumatic. You know, um, this land that we're actually sitting on right now in 1927, uh, this, when my great grandmother, Rebecca Brown Crutcher, when they came back, this is where their house was. So this is a, a bittersweet moment to know that that uh, I come from greatness, I come from black excellence, um, but to fast forward almost 100 years later and, and think about what happened to my great grandmother's community because of state sanctioned violence, because the Klan was deputized, and to think about what happened to my twin brother Terrence Crutcher on this very ground um, is traumatizing. I always say that the same state-sanctioned violence that burned down Black Wall Street in my great-grandmother's community is the same state-sanctioned violence um, that killed my twin brother with his hands in the air unarmed in this community, a descendant of this community. And so, yeah, it's um, surreal to just be sitting here on this sacred land talking about it. Chief, I want to turn to you on this one because uh, one thing I've noticed about Tulsa is driving through, there still seems to be a clear divide. There still seems to be segregation. So tell me about the community here today and how the black community has been impacted by the violence that happened here a century ago. Well, the divide, it's not even covert. You know, it's very blatant. It's very in your face kind of, you know, reality. We think about this highway that runs straight through the middle of our community. I mean, just sitting here, you can tell how obscene it is to have to, to hear all this noise as we sit on sacred ground. I mean, we're standing, we're sitting, standing on sacred ground and we, have, we don't even have the, the space to experience sacred land, right? We didn't have it in 1921, we don't have it today. So given that, what does justice look like to you? Ooh. Justice can only come in the form of restitution, reparations, and repair. Triple R effect, right? <laughs> That's the only, there hasn't been any viable solution, right? We still have to get voting rights <laughs> renewed. That's not even permanent, right? And we're looking for permanent, sustainable change. And we're not going to get that through any other means. It's just, it just, it hasn't happened and it won't happen. People saying, what are y'all doing out here protesting? That's stupid and doing this. And now people are finally hearing. And as Dr. Crutcher, my good friend here, always tells me, it's not what you say, but what you keep saying. Mm -hmm. And today, I just felt heard. I felt heard. Mm -hmm. It's not reparations, but it's our it's our voice when you come in this district. Mm -hmm. It's our voice when you when when you see it, um, and, and and it's raw. And it's they need people need to see what happened, especially since uh, Kevin Stitt um, signed this House Bill 1775, where we can't teach about the history and what happened to us. Um, because it makes white people uncomfortable, you know. And people keep saying, "Well, Christy, racism is everywhere." Mass, uh, massacres happened everywhere, but we're unique because before this state became a state, it was Indian territory, and only people who could own land here was black and natives. So we want our land back, 
We owned a third of eastern Oklahoma. This is huge. We had land. We had wealth. And people need to know that. Our people need to know that. A part of the model cities and, and a part of what the LBJ administration put these highways through a, a lot of major inner cities throughout this country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you notice there's no exits. There's no exits here. And so that really cut right into the heart. The Red Wing Hotel was right there. J.B. Stratford Hotel, the uh, Dreamland Theater. Uh, uh, the, uh, Anthony, just swing around just to show mm -hmm. the highway. Swing the camera around. Keep talking. Yes. You just swing around okay. to show the highway. Yeah, so, so that highway has really um, put a, you know, I, I always say Greenwood what is the heartbeat to all those other black communities. Okay. And that's a major artery right there. Mm -hmm. And it has really stopped a lot of people from coming here. Um, right now, the businesses on Greenwood, they don't, they don't even have any parking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, again, um, Christy said something earlier that we rebuild bigger and better. But I, I always have to just push back a little bit. Some people right. rebuild. Some, because 10,000 people were displaced and scattered all over the United States. Mm -hmm. They had to flee not as immigrants, but as refugees, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to white racial terror, terror violence, anti-black racism, white supremacy. And we're calling this weekend homecoming. Mm -hmm. You know, Greenwood, Black Wall Street is everywhere. It's a spirit. It's a mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're hoping that we can be the model. Uh, we have one opportunity, and this is the weekend that we got to scream to the top of our lungs. We want justice. We want reparations. And if we can get it here, we can get H.R. 40. Uh, that's in Congress. What the hell is the purpose of a second museum? Exactly. I mean, w why not? Why not come and say, "Hey, there's already one here. How about if we partner and expand this?" I mean, so, so like, I'm so glad you brought that up because that was the initial plan. The power structure, the philanthropic organizations, the corporations in this community, they said initially that we're going to expand the Greenwood Cultural Center. But if we give you this money, we want you to change your organizational structure. We want to come in. We want so many seats on your board. They tried to change and again and just take away that, that existing power structure. That board said, no, we're not going to do that. So they took their ball and went down the street. <laughs> so most, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. And there were many attempts at trying to look. If you're going to really do b right by this community, right. improve upon. And by the way, Greenwood Cultural Center, state funds stopped. 15 years ago, and the building has just basically been deteriorating. So our systems, the city as well as the state, did not fund this, this building. But now because we're approaching the 100-year centennial, now there's this rush, right, to put some lipstick on the barn. You know, put some lipstick on the pig mm. type thing. And that's what we see taking place here. That's why I'm, I'm very uh, uh, concerned and, and will not attend these events that I know are just facades. They're not really concerned or, 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 or focused on really doing right, atoning, repairing, reparations. That's not the goal. The goal is let's get past this 100-year centennial and, and maintain the status quo that we've established here. Tourism, okay, we because we, we've hidden the story for for, for decades, right? right? So now, but now so, that it's after, right, right. So so now how can we break, that, make right, that money? Right, right. Just like what you said. And, that, and that's porn. And, 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 and that's the thing Pimping. that I think that, that that we have to understand, and which means that if you come here. Be very deliberate. Say something. Do something. Yeah, and so ask. You don't have to. You will find somebody that's going to give you the real deal. So no, that's not what you want to go to. That's right. not where you want to support. You want to support over here because this support over here is about improving our quality of life, improving our community, and that is not. All right, Councilwoman Vanessa Hill. We appreciate that. It is critical that now, now, we not only remember what happened 100 years ago today, but that we support the black businesses in Greenwood today, that we support the black organizations in Greenwood today, that we patronize those businesses, that we raise our voices that we educate people and that we write to these politicians in Greenwood, in Tulsa, in Oklahoma, 
who aren't doing a darn thing, like the governor of the state of Oklahoma, Kevin Stitt, who has signed into law bills that will not allow for the very history of Greenwood in the very state in which he is governor of to be taught in schools on the grounds that it might make white people uncomfortable. Well, that is pathetic. When you have black people who were murdered, lynched, terrorized 100 years ago today in Greenwood, homes burnt to the ground, family members murdered, shot in the back of the head, People all over the place, lynched, burned. Bodies dumped, mass graves still being excavated now and finding more remains. Today in 2021. So, uncomfortable? Really? I think you really should be asking the black people in Greenwood about what is uncomfortable. We have to write to Governor Kevin Stitt. We have to email and we have to flood the switchboards of his office. And I'm going to be including his information at the end of this episode. You need to get in touch with him. You need to get in touch with the politicians in Tulsa. Those Republicans who are holding all of this up. And if you are in Tulsa, living in Tulsa, you need to vote. If you are in Oklahoma in general, you need to vote. And you need to vote for Democrats. This cannot be swept under the rug. And these families must get justice and reparations. That is what is needed. Justice for Greenwood at justiceforgreenwood.org Justice, F-O-R, Greenwood.org is seeking the following. One, financial compensation for the victims of the 1921 massacre and their descendants. Two, accountability for the perpetrators of the 1921 massacre. Three, Document and publicize stories of the 1921 massacre, victims and their descendants, and four, tell the truth about what happened during and after the 1921 massacre and its continued effect on victims and their descendants. They put their phone number and email address here as well, 918-956-0544 and info at justiceforgreenwood.org. Please consult that website. It's a very important one. What you will be hearing over the course of the next day or two from a lot of the heavily white politicians in Tulsa and Oklahoma at large are going to be a lot of platitudes and a lot of congratulatory backslapping but not a single dime from Greenwood Rising or anywhere else in these 100-year mock commemorations is going to the actual survivors and descendants of survivors and descendants of those murdered in Greenwood. Not a penny is being put into the black community in Greenwood. So when you hear all of this, keep that in mind because that is a story that is not being told everywhere. I want to thank Roland Martin. I want to thank Tiffany Cross. I want to thank Stanley Nelson for audio and for their tireless work in chronicling what has been going on in Greenwood 100 years on.
This is the phone number for Governor Kevin Stitt. 405-521-2342. 405-521-2342. Make sure you get in touch with the governor and let him know that reparations must be given to the descendants and survivors of the massacre at Greenwood and nothing less can possibly suffice monies must be given to those black communities in Greenwood reparations must be granted also make sure that you call the state legislature in Oklahoma get in touch with them as well And you can also tweet the governor at GovStit. That is at G-O-V, S as in Sam, T as in Thomas, I double T. We must act. We must act. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of the politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.